We were scrambling up the hill, myself on one side and the kid just over a hundred yards away, taking a different trail on the south side. As I reached the top, I was anxiously hoping to see a moose. My eyes scanned the unseen backside of that ravine. Suddenly, I felt strongly, almost an audible voice in my head say, where is the kid? What is he up to? Looking over in his direction, I, I could not believe my eyes. Surprise and danger struck me like a bolt of lightning. Never in my life had I seen anything like this. And how quickly, and how it happened so quickly, still to this day, I don't even know. Spencer Rempel, the Moose Whisperer, bringing you exciting hunting and outdoor adventure stories from around the world. Today's story is from my new friend, Elson. Elson, a little older than myself, but a similar history of hunting and trapping. Elson thinks nothing of going on a 10-mile hike to try to spot a mule deer or rambling an Argo across miles of rough tundra, pushing up snow so deep he finally switches to snowshoes just to keep on going. One fine morning over coffee, he related this rare and scary story to me, with permission to share it with you. So as usual, let's get right into it. This story takes place some 30 years ago in 1994, if I remember right. It was a beautiful warm day in the very beginning of our hunting season. We were located between White Court and Fox Creek, about 30 miles from Swan Hills. Great country for moose, elk, black bear, and hey, even keep a sharp lookout for grizzlies as well. We were pretty serious hunters, four of us in total, with two pickup trucks, two Coleman 9x12 Walp tents, two Argos, four rifles, and four full days of hunting ahead of us. As you can imagine, a lot of our first day was taken up by setting up camp. Worth it! <laughs> Having a nice camp is imperative. Returning to camp after a long, hard day of hunting and trekking through these hills, well, you can just imagine the value of a hearty meal and a good sleep. Our wall tents were high enough to stand in, had floors, cots, chairs, and a small table to make you feel at home. Our two Argos were six-wheel drive, and those vehicles could honestly take you anywhere. Not fast, not comfortable, <laughs> but a very practical machine. Here's a bit of interesting historical information for you. In those days, we weren't allowed to use any mechanized travel until noon. This was part of the fair chase regulations of the time. So, it was our practice to start walking before first light, arriving at a good, moosey-looking spot, calling, watching, waiting, sometimes just scouting other areas that might be good for the afternoon or the next morning's hunt. We'd meet back at camp for a hearty lunch and then head out on our six-wheel drive all-terrain Argos, taking us further and further into the unreached areas. We'd hunt until last light and then return in the dark to our comfortable cots and sleeping bags. Now, I was familiar with this hunting area and I had about a 10-mile or 16-kilometer loop that I could walk each morning before the vehicle restrictions were off. I'd almost always see game like a black bear, a cow moose, or whatever else I didn't have a tag for. <laughs> we had a pair of these midland walkie-talkies that worked pretty poorly, especially in the hilly country, but they'd reach maybe 500 yards. Well, this morning I was lucky enough to see a bull moose and I decided I'd radio back to camp to alert my hunting partners. Listen boys, we got a bull moose down here at Beaver Hollow which was one of my favorite spots to check. It was a big pond with lots of willow all around the edges, and the moose were always in there. Listen, guys, I radioed in. I'm on the north side, so somebody come in from the south side. Well, that never happened, as 20 minutes later, they all came walking up from behind me. <laughs> okay, boys, let's make a plan, I said. The beaver pond was, of course, in a little bit of a hollow with a hill on the south and a hill on the north. We need one of you to head back, circle around, take that other cut line, and end up on the south hillside. I'll remain here on the north hillside while you other two circle around the other direction and come in from the west where I last seen that bull moose. You'll drive him out into the open pond area and depending on who, who is closer, one of us will take the shot. Okay, sounds like a plan. So the boys all split up to do their job. 
Now, one of, one of the four of us was a 14-year-old kid named Darcy, who was really anxious to get his first moose. And we were excited to help him and be part of the experience. If at all possible, he was going to be the shooter. So we instructed him to get to the south side and get ready at a good vantage point. All my hunting partners disappeared as two were walking around one and the kid walking around the other side. It didn't take long for my two hunting partners to start the drive, walking noisily through the bush on the west side of the pond. I had a perfect vantage point and could see right across the open area, the pond, and to the other side where my eyes strained to see where our young and inexperienced hunting partner might be. I hadn't quite found where he was when I heard some loud crashing as the bull moose walked right out into the open, <laughs> just as we had planned. <laughs> Myself intently gazing across that open space between me and the moose, trying to judge accurately the distance between us. My eyes suddenly focused on some slight movement exactly straight ahead of me, but another hundred yards beyond the moose. I brought my rifle up to look through the scope to see what the movement was. It was the kid lining up for a shot with his gun so directly pointed straight in my direction, I could pretty much look down the barrel of his rifle. <laughs> I abandoned all thoughts of shooting the moose and hit the dirt for my own safety. <laughs> from behind a log, the shot rang out and it was true. He smoked that moose right in the bread basket and the bullet didn't even exit the other side. There was a slight pause, about as long as it takes to hammer another shell in, and then another shot rang out, dropping that moose only a few yards from where he originally stood. Whew! Yeehaw! Good shooting! Well, besides the fact that uh, you didn't check your background before you made that shot, but we were so excited and happy for this young man. A beautiful morning hunt with all four of us there to help skin, dress, and pack this moose out. We had a fantastic time. Our camaraderie and spirits were high. Now, because it was so early in the season, with the weather still warm and nights not even dropping below freezing, we had to get that moose meat out of there. We drew straws on who would be the one to leave and take it home to a place where the meat could be kept cool and free from flies. Doug, the father of the young man who made the kill, drew the short straw and prepared to leave camp with 500 pounds of moose meat in the box of his truck. Take care of my kid and shoot another moose, is all he had to say as he drove out of camp. With time left in the day, we were excited about an evening hunt. We drove the Argos about two miles from our camp to an old logged off area. Again, with lots of new growth. We hoped to see a moose. Plus, visibility was a lot better in this area. And sure enough, I immediately spotted two moose a long ways off. Let's try to drive a little closer to see if either of those have any antlers, I suggested. We drove around and out of sight and took an old cut line that brought us right to the bottom of the hill where we last seen that moose on. So I said to the kid, come with me, we're going to head up in this direction. Oh no, the tracks are going this way, he says, and takes off in the opposite direction. Scrambling up the hill, no, running up the hill. Well, I started running up my hill as I wanted to reach the top at the same time so we could possibly coordinate our shots or at least be there for a quick follow-up shot for the kid. Moving a lot faster than I wanted or normally would, I reached the top of the hill huffing and puffing, eyes scanning the unseen backside of the ravine. Suddenly, I felt strongly, an almost audible voice in my head say, where is the kid? What is he up to? Looking over in his direction, I could not believe my eyes. Surprise and danger struck me like a bolt of lightning. Never in my life had I seen anything like this, and how it happened so quickly, I still to this day do not even know. Well, at the top of his hill, about 150 yards away, stood Darcy the kid, frozen and violently shaking in fear. Not a word of a lie, and not three feet in front of him stood a six-foot tall black bear, staring him in the eyes with both paws out to his side. Like I said, never had I seen anything like that. 
that bear was in striking range and in a matter of a half a second could probably take his head right off. The young man shook, the bear hesitated, and I had my chance. Up came my 338 Magnum and I knew I had only a second to make this dangerous shot. You see, the bear directly in front of me, about 150 yards, but the boy just off to one side. I would have to shoot past him to hit into the bear. Well, boom went the bark of my big 338 Magnum, echoing as I flung a 210 grain bullet straight dead into the chest of that bear. I hit him hard, taking out his heart and lodging the bullet in his spine. <laughs> that bear flew over backwards and hit the ground as Darcy's gun accidentally went off in his hand from his violent shaking. <laughs> oh, now that scared Darcy something fierce and he didn't even want to talk about it. But we weren't going to let that spoil another great kill and we all ended up up there butchering up that bear and made it back to camp before nightfall. Darcy, the kid, was awfully quiet that night before we decided it was bedtime and crawled into our sleeping bags. Sleep came easy that night as we were exhausted from our day's activities. I was perhaps two hours into sawing logs and snoring away when we were all frightfully and suddenly awakened by the sound of horrible spine tingling screams. Ah! I, I, I jumped to my feet and grabbed my rifle that was always under my cot with a round chambered and the safety on. The screams came from the other tent as I Bowled through the door, Al was already there trying to console and bring consciousness to a screaming and terrified teenage boy. What's wrong? We asked him. It's that damn bear, is all he said. <laughs> Still shaking, he laid back down to try to sleep after a vicious nightmare reaccount of that bear's face only three feet from his own. Well, I went back to my tent and all of us tried to get some more sleep as it was only about 2 a.m. I finally managed to fall asleep only to relive the same experience at 4 a.m. <laughs> well, poor Darcy caught another nightmare, his lungs working fine as he screamed and hollered for the bear to get away. Man, I felt sorry for that young man. But Al was a little less sympathetic and exclaimed, That's enough! Take him home! <laughs> we drove a couple hours back into town in silence. Darcy had nothing to say and didn't want to talk about it. What are you guys doing back already? Did you get another moose? Darcy's dad, Doug, questioned when we arrived. I relayed the story to him as Darcy was still unwilling to talk about it. Well, happy to have his son home and alive, he thanked me profusely. <laughs> you won't believe it. I actually got that bear done into a full mount standing up on his hind legs with both paws extended, just like we last seen him before he took that bullet from my rifle. That mount stands in my living room, and to this day, when Darcy comes to visit, he'll say to me, do you still have that bear there? Well, yes I do, I'll say, and Darcy will eventually meander into the living room and stand before the bear, shaking his head and still unwilling to talk about it. Even now, I don't know where that bear came from or how it got standing right in front of him. But I'm sure glad I made that shot count. I've shot many bears and that's the first one that ever went straight down with only one shot. Whew. Thank you, God. Well, that's his story, folks, but I know you've got your own stories to tell. Whether hunting, hiking, survival, or any outdoor adventure story, let's tell the world. Send it in to me info at themoosewhisperer.com. You can either write it or just send a file of your voice recording of yourself relaying the tale. Send me a few photos as well and I can feature in the video and I'll be happy to relay your story to the world. Thanks for watching folks and hey, more stories to come.